Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series of dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator from the west coast dr brian good acre uh we're going to get started with dr brian so please uh, let your friends know get, uh, send him information across we have a lot of friends, a lot of students from Ethiopia, from Nigeria, from Ghana, uh, and South Africa. Please uh, send messages to them to come on. This promises to be an interesting, very uh, uh, interesting presentation. We're going to get started with Dr. Brian Goodacre. I'm going to start by reading out his bio, and uh, he's going to take it up from there. Dr. Brian uh, received his DDS from Loma Linda University uh, School of Dentistry in 2013. He completed a four and a half year combined program in prosthodontics and implant dentistry at Loma Linda University School of Dentistry in 2017, where he earned an MSD degree. He is currently an assistant professor at the School of Dentistry in Loma Linda University in California. Dr. Brian Gudeka, you know, we, it's always a pleasure to have you on Dental Webinar Series. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to, to be here. Let me share my screen and we'll, we'll get started. Awesome. Well, welcome everybody. Um, this week we're gonna talk about digital dentures and, and it's one of the topics for me that I'm quite passionate about. It's something that I've got to work with quite a bit and it's, it's a really fun area that kind of brings digital technology into one of the areas of dentistry that was probably uh, one of the last ones to kind of embrace it. Um, there's still other ones of course out there but this is a really a great area to use digital technology. So I do work with one of the companies that makes uh, digital dentures called Avident. Uh, I don't get paid by them, but they do help me with some research projects that I've done in the past and, and working on currently. Um, it's interesting when we look at the history of digital dentures. This was a great article that came out of Uni University of Connecticut, uh, Dr. Bidra and his and team. Um, they did a nice review of the history and kind of um, uh, current status and future perspectives. And it's interesting when we go and we look at this history and as we do this lecture, you'll see how we've really come full circle um, where the first article that talked about digital dentures was back in 1994, so quite a while ago. And what they did is they scanned an impression and then created a, a digital model and a shell that would allow them to position the denture teeth in a specific orientation on their design. And then flow wax into that, to that, and then they used it to conventionally process a denture. So this was kind of a, a hybrid technique where you could do both digital and uh, analog uh, procedures. Then the second article that it was ever done was they took a denture, they scanned it, and then they milled it out of wax to kind of prove the point that you could do use this to maybe duplicate a patient's denture. Um, and so they went from a laser scanner to a CNC mill and then milled out some wax. And so it really gives us kind of an interesting idea. And that was 1997. So again, quite a while ago. So they've been around for, for quite a while, but it sometimes takes us a while to really um, embrace some technology. Uh, this was an article that my father did actually back in um, 2011. And they went through this kind of proof of concept to see if you could truly mill a denture. Um, and so they took some records um, and they were able to position uh, the teeth digitally and then create this base where they mill out a recess that lets you put the denture tooth uh, into the base. Now the trick was back then there was not a way to really get a really thick puck of acrylic resin so they ended up using a material called lucite and they couldn't get a block of lucite that was thick enough to allow them to mill both the denture border as well as the papilla in between the denture teeth. So you can kind of see an example of, of you know, obviously proof of concept. You can see it in the patient's mouth. Um, and again, you would never let the patient leave your office like this, but it kind of showed a potential that yes, you could do this. And again, needed some more work, but it was kind of a good proof of concept. 
So the second denture they did, they uh, actually processed this acrylic resin. They did it kind of with a pack and press um, technique, which gave them difficulty getting a really dense material. So here you can see, if you look carefully, you can see certain things like little porosities between um, some of the teeth, some voids and irregularities because they couldn't get enough pressure when they processed this to get a really dense material, but they were able to make it much thicker. And so you can kind of see the result of that. And this is the, again, kind of an example of in the patient's mouth, you can see how it looks and that patient's still wearing that denture to, to this day. So it's kind of interesting how um, you kind of have to progress and kind of make things work because at that time they didn't have the materials that we have today to do that. Currently, we have about seven different companies that are out there. Um, and the first two that came out was Avident and Dentka. Um, then we've had many others come to the table. And the reason I put this in here is when you think about it, if you start seeing many companies starting to work on this kind of a process, it tells you that that's obviously a, they're vested, invested heavily in this, and it shows you where the future of digital dentures will be, and that it really is here to stay. Um, and we're going to go through some of the nuances of these um, companies, but primarily we're just going to focus on one, and then I'll bring up a couple other things as well. But it's just kind of nice to know there's seven different systems out there. Um, the companies are really pushing this type of um, denture process, and it's, it, again, it's it's for good reason because it's a great way to do to fabricate dentures. So what we'll do is we're going to focus on uh, these kind of specific topics. We'll talk about the benefits of digital dentures because we need to know why do we want to do this? What's the real benefit of a digital denture? We'll talk about the clinical workflows, which technically I feel that like that falls under a benefit, um, but I separated just so we can focus a little more on it. Um, we'll talk about intraoral scanning, how to use that or not use that, uh, depending on your preference. Um, and then we'll talk about 3D printing as well. And that's kind of just kind of where things are moving. So we'll, we'll get more into that in a second. When it comes to the benefits, you know, what we're looking for is we're looking for a way to fabricate a denture that can be extremely stable in a patient's mouth that we can put pressure on, you know, the inc incisal edges of the central incisors, pull on the canines and fabricate a denture that has great retention uh, for, for the patient so that they can get the most kind of benefit out of their, their dentures. Now, denture can be processed many ways. We know that you can achieve that with good records and, and and um, you know, adjustments, conventional denture. So that's not a surprise, but the idea is, is there a way for us to make a denture that's gonna fit better more consistently every time we fabricate a denture? And that's really where we're focusing on digital dentures. So the first thing we wanna look at is, that we're gonna talk about is denture base adaptation. And uh, then we'll look at the retention that that should hopefully improve by increasing the denture base adaptation. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the material properties um, as well. So when we look at the denture base adaptation, I did a study when I was a resident and I looked at both the denture base adaptation as well as how much tooth movement occurs with a denture uh, fabricated with multiple different techniques. So what we did is we looked at four different processing techniques where we had a conventional pack and press, we had a fluid resin technique, we had an injection type of processing as well as a CAD CAM milled. And when we looked at how well that denture fits onto the cast. So what we did is we scanned the cast before we started. Then after uh, we processed that denture, we scanned the intaglio surface of that denture and we were able to superimpose those on each other and see how well they would fit. You can see some examples with these colors to show areas that contacted nicely, areas that did not. Um, and so you can see in these pictures, anything that was a green color would be really nice adaptation between the denture and the cast. So we would ideally want to see this with all green. Areas that had blue in color would be a space between the cast and the, and the uh, denture. And then areas that are yellow or red were pressure. And so you can see the large variation amongst the different techniques. Um, and you can see how the CAD CAM mill group had the most uniform adaptation, still not perfect, but much better than the other techniques. Um, when we look at uh, how much movement happens to the teeth, which really, you know, explains why we have to do so much adjustment 
adjustments when we do conventionally processed dentures, you can see how much the teeth moved. And the two techniques that involve applying pressure to the flask while it's being processed, which is pack and press and injection, had the most tooth movement, which is what we would have expected. The fluid resin had not as much just because it kind of just relies on um, the the polymerization of that material itself. Whereas when you look at the CAD CAM group, you can see we have two different types of digital dentures or milled dentures. One where they mill the denture and then you bond the denture tooth into the base. And so that's a, it's a manual process. So there's some variability in how well you adapt the, or how you position that tooth in the base. So you can definitely have variability there. And then you also have a CAD CAM monolithic denture where where the pink and the white part of the denture is all one material that's milled out. And therefore the machine or the CNC mill is doing all of that. So you do not, you do not have as much variability in that tooth position. So that was the most accurate way to do it was a monolithic type of, of denture. Other studies now have come out and have looked at many different, even within digital dentures, different digital denture systems and their accuracy. And it's, it's kind of interesting to see that comparison. Um, again, what they found when they compared a pack and press type of technique to CAD CAM milling is milling um, was produced, CAD CAM milling produced the best fit. Um, however, there is variation amongst each of those different companies. And, and it makes sense because each company is gonna have their own specific kind of software that tells the mill how to mill. Each mill will have specific accuracy levels or different sizes of the burrs that they use to mill. So there's a lot of variability that plays into this. And um, so we would expect to see some different. There's a lot of systems out there. They all do have some variability. However, all of them were better than a conventionally processed denture in terms of denture base adaptation. Uh, the next thing we'd like to look at is say, well, if we have better denture base adaptation, do we have better denture retention? So um, a classmate of mine did a, a great study where it was kind of an interesting way to evaluate this. And he fabricated multiple dentures um, conventionally as well as milled, and then had this contraption that he, he uh, kind of put together where they were able to put a little hook in the middle of the palate of the denture. And then they used kind of some pulleys and um, a uh, testing machine to see how much force it took to dislodge the denture. So the patient would kind of sit in this little contraption and they would um, uh, use some pulleys and pull and see how much force it took to dislodge that denture. And so with the comparison of the two of them, they found milled complete denture base had produced significantly higher retention than conventional um, heat polymerized denture bases. And, you know, the value amount, sometimes I, I personally never can kind of wrap my head around the difference between a, a Newton's um, in a terms that I can really think of. So if we see that difference, it was a difference about four and a half pounds of force to dislodge the denture. And so whether or not that's clinically significant, hard to really know. But at the end of the day, if I'm a a patient, I'd rather have that extra four and a half pounds between me and embarrassing myself in a restaurant, maybe um, with my denture coming out. So it's something at least to keep in mind that at least it's good to see that trend that it has better denture base adaptation. And at the same time, that does lead to better denture retention. So it's what we would expect. And it's uh, nice to see that again, whether or not four and a half pounds is clinically significant, very hard to tell. The, the last uh, benefit, and there's many more benefits we could talk about, but I'm gonna focus just on some of the material properties. And so you saw in that first example I talked about where you know the difficulty was finding a, a dense enough acrylic resin to mill these dentures out of. And so those are some of the big advances that we've seen is the ability of many companies now to make very dense pucks of acrylic resin. So they're very thick, they're processed under extreme pressure so that you have <clears throat> very dense and uh, porosity free um, pucks of acrylic resin that can be milled. Um, and that really has been kind of the game changer when it comes to milling of uh, dent. We've also seen because of that in the extreme pressure that they're done and that they're processed under, you have reduced residual monomer, which is always a benefit. They also have um, less porosities and things. So the surface is less adherence of candida um, when they've evaluated this. So all of which are, are beneficial for us in the long run, um, just to try and improve and have a better material that we place in our patient's mouths. Some studies that have looked at some of the more strength, uh, physical properties of these materials. This is a great study that was done out of Switzerland, a friend of mine did. And um, 
they compared conventional and mill denture materials. They did three point bend tests and different things. And what they found was that milled had about a 26% improvement in some of the factors such as ultimate strength. And so that's something that lets us know that these dentures uh, uh, materials are stronger because of how they're processed. And the way that that really benefits us the most is it allows them to mill a denture uh, with a thinner thickness, but still achieving the overall strength that we want. Um, so here in this, uh, you know, they, they found there's a very significant difference between, or there is a distinct difference, hard to say what's clinical or, or not, uh, but a distinct difference between conventional and milled. And by having this improved strength, we can mill dentures where we can have one, the computer can create a uniform thickness of the palatal contours so that you can see when you hold a denture up to the light, you can see it's uniform thickness, the light passes through it, you can mill it thinner while still achieving the same strength that you would have with a conventional denture. And with a conventional denture, it's very difficult to have this uniform thickness. Um, so that's something that can help a patient adapt to it uh, much easier than have this kind of bulky area of, of a denture. So it's something that really does give us a nice benefit overall. So those are just a few of the benefits. We can go on and have honestly a lecture just about the benefits, um, but that was kind of the three I wanted to talk about today. Um, the next one, which I, like I mentioned before, I feel is still a clinical, is still a benefit, but it's gonna be the clinical workflows. And, and really, you know, when you think of how you fabricate a denture, you know, there's many ways you can do it, but how many appointments does it really take? You know, uh, traditionally we start with a five appointment workflow. That's kind of that conventional processing of doing all the different steps that you go through to make a denture. Um, but really what we have to ask is, can we do it in fewer appointments? Can we do it in three appointments? You know, great, that would save us chair time, be beneficial for the patient, of course. Could you even do it in two appointments? You know, these are some of the things we have to kind of talk about. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through these options of using digital dentures and kind of their technology to fabricate dentures in both a three appointment as well as a two appointment workflow. So let's start with the three appointment workflow and we'll kind of give you some ideas of when to use it, when not to use it, or, or when it can be more beneficial to do some other things. So. When it comes to a three appointment workflow, um, you know, a couple of things I like to think about when it comes to when to do this is, you know, does the, you know, does the patient have an existing denture or not is kind of one of those things. So if they do not have an existing denture or their existing denture is not something you really want to use um, as a reference because it's maybe significantly off of what you're looking for. Um, a three appointment workflow is a great way because it allows you to do something like an aesthetic try-in. And we'll go through specifically my, per, my personal favorite version of this, but um, it allows you to kind of get that, that, a sec, that second appointment can allow you to customize it to the patient's liking. And that, that's kind of a really big benefit. Um, different types of try-ins and each company will have their own kind of variation of this. But this is the one from Avident that I use the most. It's called a Wagner try and we'll go into more detail on that one in a second. Um, you have other options where they can do, you know, companies will do printed or milled try ins where they're all white. So you can at least see the positions of the teeth in the patient's mouth. And some, some companies will even allow you to do a printed try and where it'll still it'll even have the pink and the white transitions for you to just use as a try in. So you got different and options out there. Um, they all can work well. Um, I'll explain a little more why I personally like the Wagner try-in as we go through that here in a second. So if we think of three appointments, the first appointment, I use a thermoplastic tray. There's many of these out there. This happens to be the one that I like to use. Um, it's a, a prosthodontist from Albuquerque, New Mexico, came up with this Dr. Steve Wagner, amazing guy um, that um, just really came up with a nice way to have a really kind of easy to mold tray that I personally like, but there's a lot of these out there. Um, and so what you can do, they come in individually packaged containers. Um, and so what I do is you again, warm it up, um, and then it, about for about a minute, and then you can see how it really just becomes moldable. I sped the video up just for the sake of the lecture, but you can see how we soften until it's nice and soft. And then, for example, um, you can then place that in the patient's mouth and mold that. Um, and so you can turn in, you know, a matter of a minute or two, create a custom tray rather than doing the traditional make a diagnostic impression then fabricate a custom tray. You can do that all in one appointment and right there saves you an entire appointment for that patient. 
So once we've done border molding, do we do a wash impression just as an example? Um, then the next part we do is we'll locate the incisive papilla of the patient and we'll go ahead and do some lip measurements. And so what we do is there's many ways to do this. They make these lip rulers um, that you can place on the patient's incisive papilla. Then you have the patient relax their lip. You can then record that position of the lip at rest. And then you can go ahead, have the patient smile. And then you're going to go ahead and record the patient's lip during smile. And so what this is doing is it's telling you a couple things. The, incis the lip at rest gives you a very rough ballpark as to where you'd want the incisal edge of your maxillary central incisor. And so that gives you a starting point. Then when you have the patient smile, it tells you, well, how much of that tooth is that patient gonna show when they, you know, if you put the incisal edge at the lower mark, how much of that tooth will they show? So in this patient specifically, it was 12 millimeters. So with 12 millimeters, you think most maxillary central incisors are, you know, somewhere between 11 and 12 millimeters, uh, depending on who you, who you look at. And there's a, a range there for sure. That patient would show the entire tooth. Now, what you have to think about is, do I really want to put the incisive papilla, or sorry, the incisal edge of the maxillary central incisor at that point? That's kind of a decision you make. I, I traditionally will not put it there. I'll put it a few millimeters of, because most patients that have dentures, again, depends on your patient, but are a little bit older. And so as we age, we know our maxillary lip, our upper lip longer, and therefore we show less and less of our maxillary teeth. So that's something that you kind of will make a decision as to what you feel is a good position to start. So in this patient, I probably would have set, you know, please place the, you know, in the, when I send this to the lab, I'd ask them to please place the tooth at, you know, maybe 50, at the 15 mark there or something like that to give me a little bit more realistic um, of where that incisal edge would be, but you use this to kind of convey this information to, to, the, to the lab. Then you're gonna select the tooth mold and shade um, like we would do um, all the time. And then the last thing I, have, I do in the first appointment is I, I personally like to get a preliminary vertical dimension, uh, kind of a centric relation record. So I'll show you what I do. I just you know, determine my vertical dimension that, that's proper for this patient. Then I use a anterior triple tray and use some laboratory putty. Um, and we'll go ahead and, and make enough of it to place in the tray. And then I will actually have the patient um, kind of close down until I get into a rough centric relation position at the desired vertical. Now, this is something that um, you have to just make, you know, I try and get close. I'm not saying this is gonna be the final centric relation record, but it's just getting me in the ballpark. Now, it's important that when you do this record, you're measuring to make sure that the record you get is at the planned vertical dimension. Sometimes, you know, we do this here at the school um, with our pre-doc students and, you know, depending on the combination of the student's experience or the faculty's experience, you know, sometimes they'll get this record and they'll have the patient close down too far. Well, then it's not really beneficial, of course. So you have to make sure you verify that vertical dimension and that you're at that position. And then with that record, we can go ahead, you can see what it would look like. We can even do a wash impression inside of it if we'd like um, to give us more detail, which is what I like to do because it allows them to get an initial position of that, um, that relationship so they can start when they do the try. It, it doesn't have as much adjustment you might need. So it's, it's a, it saves you some time clinically, I feel. Then you can either take those records and mail them to the company or you can interorally scan them. So we have, you know, different options that uh, kind of depends on your workflow and what works for you. I personally like to scan them and then electronically send them because it's a lot quicker to do. Um, so here you can see we can also go ahead and take our impressions and scan those. Um, and so when you scan an impression, you start with the crest of the ridge in the impression part of it. Then I do the palette kind of in this horseshoe pattern, which you'll see is very similar to how you scan in the mouth. And then I'll focus on the border itself. So that's just kind of giving you an idea of how to, how to scan. In the mandible, it's the same process. You scan the crest of the ridge and I'll show you a video of one of these in a second. Then you'll do your lingual border and then your, your buccal border. And that allows you to scan it quickly. If you have an intraoral scanner, it allows you to digitize that quite quickly and efficiently. So if we look at that maxillary impression here, you can kind of see how we do that. So we're gonna scan the crest of the ridge. 
go all the way around, then kind of in a horseshoe pattern, kind of back and forth, we'll scan the palette. Um, and then we'll be able to uh, um, scan the border itself. And then that allows us to just get a digital copy of that impression, which allows us to just electronically submit that and use it in multiple ways. Um, with any digital denture program you're gonna use, they're all gonna use some form of a, a digital file, like an STL file or something to you know, have a copy of that to design off of. So it allows you to digitize this in the clinic real quick and have that file. And then you don't have to worry about mailing something or, or scanning it with a lab scan or anything. Um, again, this is assuming you have that uh, intraoral scan in your, in your office. If not, of course, you can mail the records and have the lab scan that for you. So here you can see the scan with the color. And then when you turn the color off, you can kind of see um, things. And then you even have the you can see the um, the actual position. Is everything good? With perfect. Sorry, I think there was some technical glitch from the Zoom. No, okay. don't worry, not a problem at all. Um, so with this, you can get your final centric relation record as you see here, and then that's gonna allow them to now have that refined version. So this is the reason why I like to get a preliminary centric relation at the first appointment because it allows me in the second appointment to really only have to focus on, a, on the aesthetics and not have to worry too much about, you know, is my vertical dimension off? But again, that would all come down to how accurate that first record is. Um, so this record here can be scanned as well and then that's digitally sent to them. And uh, then what they're gonna do is use that as a reference to set your final denture. So here's kind of a preview of what you get. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll propose the original setup of the denture, and then they send you this and you're gonna go ahead and look at it and you can rotate it around. So here you're gonna see, I can, I can turn on um, my try-in. So right here, if you look, this is a, the scan from my Wagner Trium. So for me, this becomes my reference to say, hey, this is what looked good in the patient's mouth. If they follow this, I'm good to go. And then you can just worry about just doing any little tweaking. So here you can see I can now turn on and verify, for example, that the anterior teeth match. So here I can see the midlines on, the incisal edge positions are all the same. Then I can turn on the posterior teeth and start evaluating other things, you know, and again, based on the patient's aesthetics and, uh, and anatomy, we can kind of finalize our position of where the teeth should be. We can look at it from different views and we can say we like this or we don't like this. And then we have the option to go ahead and either at this point say, hey, this looks great. Go ahead and make the denture. Or let's say we didn't like it. And we say, well, I don't really like this one, so why don't we make some changes? So if you do a thumbs down here, it lets you go to the digital setup editor, which lets you physically move the teeth yourself. And that's something that I really like because it gives me the freedom to customize this. So in this software, I can say, okay, I want to change the amount of overbite. I can, you know, rotate the teeth to make them, you know, soft or bold kind of setups. You can, um, you know, turn on your reference and say, oh, I really want more curve of speed. So you can move, you know, and really change all those factors of a denture. You can shift the midline. You know, there's a lot of things you can do very quickly that with a traditional setup in wax would take you hours to change. I can um, change the size of the teeth so you can make them bigger, smaller. Um, you really have the freedom to do whatever you would like. Um, and so that gives you kind of really the, you know, the, the options to really customize it to whatever you like. Diastemas, you can move the teeth individually, um, together by themselves. You know, you really have the options to, to really do whatever you would like. And so it's something I really like. It also allows you to then finalize the occlusion based on um, the setup. So they'll kind of refine that. And then once you're happy with it, then you can save the changes and then approve it. So you have options where you can either tell the lab, please, make these changes and you type them out in, in, um, in like kind of, you know, in a sentence form, 
or you can go in and do it yourself. So it kind of depends on what you like to do. I personally like to go in and move them um, just because I feel like I can get exactly what, what I want. Um, and so that's something that's nice. And every single company will have some version of this, whether or not you'll be able to physically move it yourself. Uh, it kind of depends on the system. Um, but either way, the idea is the lab can do an initial setup for you and then you can kind of finalize it, which is, is nice to be able to do. And then once you hit um, save the changes and approve the design, they'll go ahead and mill that. And so here's that exact setup, the denture that um, they milled. This is a monolithic denture where the pink and the white is all one material. Um, and so then you can see it here in the patient's mouth. Again, very similar uh, to the try-in. So we kind of know that we're not going to have any big surprises when we see this in the patient's mouth because we did a try-in. We customized it. The setup on the computer was very similar to that other than us making some few changes. Um, and then it's, again, a nice predictable way to make a denture. And that's, again, in three appointments. So if we walk through how we do this, let's go through the three appointments here. The first, first appointment, we're going to get some records. We're going to make our impressions. We're going to go ahead, get our lit measurement um, and that preliminary centric relation record. And then we're going to select the tooth, shade, and mold. You know, that's, that's all you're going to do in the first appointment. That's a little bit busier of an appointment, but you get all of that in one appointment. Then in the second appointment, we do our try-in with our Wagner try-in. We go ahead and we do evaluate, we do our aesthetic try-in, customize the tooth positions. We'll determine our and record um, with that try-in. And using that information, the company can then go ahead and design your final denture. And then here you can see, again, we would just have our third appointment, the placement of the final denture. So that would be, my per that's the way I like to do a three patient that either I don't like their existing denture or it's just not a great reference or I want to have that, that freedom to let the patient see the changes I want to make with the aesthetic trine, which I tend to do most of the time because I like that ability to, to customize it and let the patient see it. So that's three appointments. Now, what happens about a two appointment? How could you do this in fewer appointments, let's say with two appointments? And so let's talk about some of the criteria that would allow you to go with a two appointment workflow. So one of them would be, of course, the patient has to have an existing denture. Um, there needs to be minimal changes that are required. Um, and therefore you can kind of use that existing denture as a nice reference. So this is a patient that had a denture made many years ago. Um, and now we're just gonna go ahead and make him a new denture but the patient loves everything about the existing denture. And so we can really use that as a great reference to fabricate a new denture. So what we'll do is let's go through how we do this in, in two appointments. So for example, here's the, uh, the patient. He has uh, this existing denture my father actually made, I think it was like 15 years ago, if I remember the dates right. Um, it was a porcelain denture teeth. Um, you know, and over the years, he's had a number of these teeth debond. I've rebonded them in and fixed them. You can see the mandibular denture was actually used a long time ago as a radiographic template um, for to do like a dual scan where they put gutta percha on the facial surface. This was many, many years ago. Nowadays, we would do it differently, like I showed last week. Um, and uh, so the patient likes it, we're just gonna make a new one. So what we can do is use his existing denture as a custom tray. And so we go ahead and do a wash impression inside of that denture, both in the maxilla and the mandible. And then we get our centric relation record um, in the patient's, using the patient's existing denture. Now, remember he's worn it for many years. He's comfortable to it, everything works well. There's no real reason to change anything significantly. So what we can do is take that record go ahead, intraorally scan it. So the patient's in your chair, you've got these records, I now scan it. And now I have my digital record of that uh, denture. Then I can go ahead, take out the impression material, clean it up, give it back to the patient. He can go home on his way and I have the records I need to make a denture. So it allows me one appointment, get all those records. <clears throat> this scan can be sent um, to the company. And all we have to do is tell them which tooth mold and which shade uh, we want to use. So here's the same preview. You can see there's the scan of his existing denture. And then there's the proposed tooth position that they showed. And then I can go ahead and customize anything that I would like if, if I need to. Um, so there's the final design that they proposed. And then here's the, the mill denture itself. And so you can see how we can really kind of follow that. And so we didn't make a lot of changes. There's tiny things patient, you know, either requested or we decided to do. Um, but the patient really liked having 
his mandibular anterior teeth kind of irregular, so it didn't look like a, a denture. So if you look, for example, here, we're able to build in this kind of irregular, and I honestly, I wish all patients would let me do this because it's a lot of fun. Um, and it also makes it look, you know, no one would say, oh, that's a denture because, you know, it looks too irregular. Most people with a denture want it to look perfect, like they had ortho and, and all of this, which, you know, nothing wrong with that either. It's just, it's nice to be able to customize it for the patient. Um, they can also mill in the recesses for the locators. So hollow them out. You may have to open them just a little bit more depending on what you requested. And so then you can see the final denture in the patient's mouth. And um, again, the beauty of it, this was the first place, you know, placed in the patient's mouth, haven't adjusted yet, got retractors in there and just have them open and close. And, you know, that's pretty darn close. Uh, and so again, the beauty of using his existing records is it allows us to do things like that, which I think really can, uh, you know, streamline the process more predictable. And again, the patient had this denture for many years before this, so why go crazy and change too much? Um, and so that's where I think a second two appointment workflow works really well. And it's just very convenient to do. But again, in this case, you would have to have some form of a um, a scanner to scan it, or you'd have to duplicate his existing denture, um, you know, separately um, so that you could keep the record uh, if you don't have an intraoral scanner. So there, again, some limitations, but it's a nice way to be able to make a denture for a patient. So I hope that kind of gave you a little introduction into some of the clinical workflows. You know, the beauty of digital dentures are you can pretty much fabricate it exactly how you do it now. It's just a matter of once you get those records, you scan them or send them in and then they digitize them and then they can do a digital denture workflow. So you don't have to go by these specific workflows. You could go all the way through to an aesthetic try and conventionally with wax rims and then aesthetic try and then scan that and send that in and they can use that. So, you know, you really have the ability to come in and out of of a digital workflow as much as you would like. Um, so you don't have to change how you do things if you're really comfortable with a specific way of doing it. But that's to me the best way to do is those three appointment or two appointment um, that I like to do. And it really kind of streamlines the process for me. And again, it's favorable for the patient. They don't have to come to your office as much. It doesn't take as much chair time. So you can be more efficient with it, which I think is always what we're kind of looking for. But we don't want to sacrifice some of the quality that we're used to. So we have to have the ability to customize it, look at it in the patient's mouth, which is what I like to do. So the next part we're going to talk about a little bit is intraoral scanning. And this is something that's kind of fun. It's, you know, I'd call it relatively new um, when it comes to dentures, but, you know, we've been scanning teeth for a long time. And so who's to say we can't scan a patient as well. And so this is something that I've been having fun with. Um, you know, there's a lot of people now looking at this, which is great. Um, and, um, you know, I've so far done, I think around 12 uh, dentures this way. Um, and it works works quite well, but I'm gonna kind of point out the good and the bad about it because um, you know, it's not as easy as it looks uh, like most things are that way, unfortunately in dentistry. So um, there's been some studies that have looked at things, you know, this is, a, this is one of the earlier studies that kind of talked about, you know, the ability of intraoral scanners to scan edentulous models. Now this was done on a plastic model. So we're talking ideal circumstances, no saliva, no tissue movement. Um, and what, what they really found was digitization of edentulous models was feasible, but there was a high level of inaccuracy. Um, and so that was kind of like, ooh, that doesn't sound great. Um, now, I don't know this specifically, but when I read through their article, you know, they bring up some issues where they have this stitching error that you see. And what I found based on their description is that they did a zigzag pattern in the palate. Now, I don't know that this is exactly what they did, but my feeling is if they followed this path, it would explain why they got the stitching error. So they kind of, if they follow this kind of zigzag pattern, there's a good chance you could get some stitching errors that would lead to the marks or the kind of that discrepancy you see with the little red arrows in, the, in their picture. And the reason this could happen is if you think of how an intraoral scanner works, you know, it's a, it's a camera, it's taking multiple pictures. So if you think of it, you're taking multiple pictures and based on the parts of those pictures that are overlapping, the computer is going to stitch that into a much larger image. So with that being said, the way in which you scan a patient is going to affect the accuracy of what you can get. So that's why you can see here, I kind of go in a horseshoe pattern. I'll show you more about this here in a second. But you have to remember with how the scanner works, and that allows you to think of, well, what's the most efficient and accurate way to scan a patient? So we'll talk a little bit more about the specific pattern, but I think that really kind of explains why they had some problems when they went and they scanned the patient. 
Um, the other thing that some studies have looked at are adding different things to the tissue surface. Um, you know, they've talked about, well, put pressure indicating paste on the palate, maybe to help give it some unique structures or, or um, shapes and, and texture that can the scanner can recognize better. Some have even gone to the point where they put little um, composite markers on the tissue just temporarily while they're scanning. Um, and, you know, they feel that in these studies that it improved the ability to scan, scan a patient. Um, I went through on one of my very first patients a number of years ago now, um, and we scanned the patient. I scanned him multiple times because I was interested by reading some of these articles. I was like, hmm, does that really make a difference or not? So I scanned the patient five times. Um, again, this is one patient, so I can't say that it's across the board, but I tried something where I didn't add anything to the palate. I tried radiopaque markers like we showed last week to um, that kind of stick to the tissue. I tried using intraoral scan spray. I tried a little bit of pressure indicating paste. And of course, if a little is good, you have to try a lot. So I put a lot on there to see if it really made any difference. And, and I found that I could not notice any difference between the, the any of those techniques in scanning. So naturally, for me, I don't add anything because I don't feel that it adds uh, any benefit whatsoever. So again, this was only in the maxilla. We'll talk a little bit about the mandible because that's a different different story. But um, it's interesting to see, you know, again, thankfully, I didn't see a difference. So I think that's good news, because it means we don't have to do it, um, which I, I think anything we can do to not have to add all this stuff would be beneficial for us. The, the first question I get whenever I talk about uh, intraoral scanning for a denture is what about the denture border? And, and I think that's a, a very important question to ask, because at the end of the day, you know, that's a very difficult thing for us to replicate. So, you know, when we think of a denture border, it is extremely complex. You know, you think of the muscles that make up each of these things, um, each border, each, you know, frontal attachment. I mean, there's a lot of stuff involved with that. And so, you know, the real question is, can you really replicate a denture border with an intraoral scanner? And I would say, personally, you can't exactly replicate it like you see here because you cannot trigger the muscles during movements to, to actually locate the every single thing. But that being said, if we think of how we each make a denture impression, we're all going to have various techniques. And that means if I border mold or you border mold, we're going to have differences in our impressions. So that tells me right there, it's not that we have to get it exactly perfect for that patient to survive because we're all going to do it differently. So while we're not going to record every single uh, extension or every functional movement of a patient with a scanner, I think it's still something that would still work for most patients. Now, there's going to be exceptions because it always comes down to proper patient selection because if you think about it, we know that you know there's always going to be that scenario where you know a patient has a very you know severely resorbed maxilla or mandible, um, and especially mandible where you're having to push the limits a little bit to try and get whatever little retention you can. So you might overextend a certain area just a little bit, or do you know significant functional um, border molding. Um, and in those cases, I would say do that conventionally and then scan your impression. I don't think intraoral scanning is gonna be your answer there. So, you know, again, always in dentistry, it comes down to proper patient selection. And you really need patients that have an adequate ridge morphology. So you have a decent amount of a residual ridge because uh, you have to have, um, you know, an, some contour for the scanner to, to recognize that's unique. If it's all flat, um, the scanner has difficulty picking that up. So you also need to have some attached mucosa because if that tissue is always moving, you can't scan something where the tissue in one second is in one position and then the next it's somewhere else because the computer cannot stitch those together. So that's why you have to really keep that, that in mind. Um, you know, if we want to see how much variation exists, so this was an example, I, I did a conventional impression, and then I did a digital impression. And then what I did is I scanned those and then used some software to allow me to superimpose those together. And so here, I superimposed the two impressions. And now we're going to see how much variation exists. And so if we look at it, the gold color is the digital scan. And then the blue color is my traditional impression. And if we look carefully, you can see I've got some areas where I overextended with my digital impression. Um, and so that gives you some ideas where I'm over. There's some areas where I'm under. And there's a lot of areas that are really close. But if we look careful and we actually measure how much, dis, uh, dis, um, how much difference uh, exists, we can actually go ahead and measure that. And you can see most of my borders are 
you know, less the maximum I had was a difference of around two and 2.3 millimeters. So it gives you an idea that worst case scenario, I was off around two millimeters. And in, in, in removable, two millimeters is not really that significant. If it was a fixed, you know, crown, that's life, that's huge. That's a major problem. But um, with removable, not so bad. So that gives you, and I think if we looked at the difference between my border molding and somebody else's, we would probably be, you know, within that range if we just did conventional border molding. So I think it's not too bad, but again, it's proper patient selection that we have to look at. Um, there is a great study that looked at this, um, again, from Switzerland, and uh, they compared multiple impression techniques. And what they found, again, they used an optrogate uh, to retract the cheeks. So here you can see the optrogate uh, retracting the tissue. And then they used all these markers on the tissue to, to help um, you know, pick up the location. Um, and what, what they did is they compared um, you know, alginate, uh, PVS, um, different variations of a PVS technique, and then also the intraoral scan. And they superimposed it very similar to like I just showed you, and they found the uh, most deviation at the was at the peripheral border, which is what we would expect, and it was around two, uh, a little over two millimeters. So again, similar to what I found. Again, I only did one, one or two patients. This is again, they did multiple samples, so excellent to see that it kind of confirmed what I found, and I was like glad to see that with multiple patients, they 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 had similar results because when you do one or two patients, you never know if that's just a an outlier or if it's actually true. So it was good to see from the study to kind of back that up. Um, interestingly enough, the patient's preferred alginate was their favorite, then came PVS, then came the trios. Um, and it was interesting that what they talked about is they felt that the reason the trios was not as high in the patient preference was because of how they retracted the tissue as well as placing the markers on the tissue itself. So, you know, those are things that, you know, hey, it's good to know that, hey, well, if we modify how we're retracting the the cheeks or the tissue, that's one thing patient didn't like. And then also, hey, we don't really need to put those markers because um, we've already talked about that, that it really doesn't benefit you, benefit you to put those little uh, markers on the tissue. So that kind of can solve some of those things, but interesting to see. So I first started retracting the tissue with a Branamark kind of one piece retractor. And I you know, did that a little bit and then I found that the retractor got in the way. So I stopped doing that. And what I do now is I just retract the cheek with my, my finger. I can again, nicely reapproximate the border based on, you know, if you were gonna border mold, you can kind of really get an idea for the, where, the, where the role of the soft tissue would be. So that's something that I've started to do. And I just use my finger, I, I retract it to where I feel like it would be and then I'll hold it there while I scan. And again, that's something that, again, takes a little practice because it's hard to hold still while you're scanning, but I found it works quite well. Um, and it, for me, it works a lot better than using any other type of retractor. Um, but everybody will kind of find their own little magic way to do that. Um, so what's the specific pathway in which we like to scan a, a patient? So if we have an edentulous patient like this, what I like to do is I, again, start on the crest of the ridge. So it's just like you scan a patient that has all of their teeth, you start with the, the crest of the ridge. And that's because that becomes your home base that when you go to scan the rest of it, the computer will stitch the rest of the images based on this center area. And so you can get a nice accurate scan. Then I go and I scan the palatal area and I kind of go in a horseshoe pattern um, and that's to allow me not to get those stitching errors that we saw with one of the earlier studies that they were, that they they talked about. Um, then what I do is I'll retract the you know the buccal uh, mucosa, the cheek, and everything, and then I'll scan that border in one pass up to the midline. And, and the the tricky part here is you have to hold it still while you scan because you only get one pass with the scanner to scan that area because if you try and go back again what do you think the chances are you're going to hold that tissue in the exact same position not very likely so that's again one of the challenges and again like i mentioned before a limitation with intraoral scanning so i'll go to the midline and then i'll come around and scan the other side and do the same thing and the other thing to remember is with an intraoral scanner it's a lot easier for you to take the scanner out of the mouth as opposed to push it against the cheek to the back of the mouth. So that's why I do it that way. It helps uh, me feel like it's easier to do and it's more comfortable for the patient. 
So here's that intraoral scan of this patient. Um, you can see it with the color, which sometimes, you know, patients love to see the color, but I find it a lot easier to evaluate it with the color off. So if we remove the color, now I can see kind of all the anatomic structures I would look for in a regular impression or a master cast. So I can see, did I really get everything extended properly? You can also see where I start to get the roll of the soft tissue, which gives me an idea of where I would extend that denture. Um, in the mandible, it's a more challenging situation, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, but um, you really have one, one pass. You just kind of go back and forth. You can't really go back and do the crest of the ridge, then come back and do the lingual, and then the buckle. Um, it's very difficult to do because you have so much, you know, everything's moving. You have the tongue that moves, the cheek that moves, and this patient specifically did not have a lot of a, you know, did not have much of a thick band of keratinized mucosa, so it was again a difficult one, but you can still do it. Sometimes if you have more of a uh, residual ridge that's a little bit more prominent, you can then scan more of the lingual and, and the buckle a little bit easier, but again, case by case. And again, the mandible is much more difficult. There, there's no question. And I think that's also true with conventional impressions as well. So here's the patient uh, with the color on. We remove the color. Um, and then I'm gonna move it around so you can kind of see what that looks like. So if you look at this, you can see how we can start to evaluate, okay, what about our retromylohyoid area, you know, back here, there's our, you know, buckle, our retromolar pad. Uh, we can see the ridge. We can see our buckle shelf over here and see how that's looking. Um, and so you can really start to get an idea of, you know, did I capture everything that I want to? Um, and again, I think you, you definitely can, but I'll tell you it's not as easy in the mandible as it is in the maxilla. Maxilla is very easy, um, I feel. Um, so maxilla is easier than the mandible. Uh, maxilla typically requires about two to three minutes to scan. Uh, the mandible sometimes five to 10 minutes. However, I've done, you know, maxilla in a minute um, sometimes. So you can kind of get an idea. Um, takes two people to do this, not really a, too big of a deal in dentistry, thankfully, but one to scan. And, and then in the mandible, I normally will have somebody help retract the tongue. Um, if we think of how long it takes to do a conventional uh, mandibular impression, you can see it's about three sections for border molding, at least how I like to do it sometimes. You know, you'll do that buckle border, maybe one section, then I'll do the lingual extensions in two separate sections, and then a wash impression, let's say. And so you're waiting for the impression material to set up, you know, for, you know, four different times. And so if you think of how long that takes, you know, 60 to 90 seconds, uh, depending on faster or whatever set um, PVS you're using, for example, and then the total set time about four to six minutes. So you can really see that technically, you know, the time is really not too bad um, different uh, and you can actually do it much faster in the maxilla. In the mandible, again, depending on the patient and your expertise, um, that can be good, good or bad. So that's something you have to kind of keep in mind. Mandible is definitely more challenging. Um, I've talked to some different people that have done a lot of this and there's a there's a you know very talented um, dentist in in Italy, Dr. LaRusso, that's done a lot of these, and he's probably done. I think he has to have done the most intraoral scans of anybody I know in edentulous patients. And I you know I asked him you know how often he can't scan the man scan a mandible, and he said he's never been able to. He's never had a problem with scanning a mandible. He always can do it. Um, and you know, so I don't know, maybe his technique's a little bit better, but I've had a, at least two that I could not scan. So I think that's kind of something that will come with time. You know, maybe it's, I just need to get better at it. Um, but you know, he's done hundreds of them and has had no problem. So that's good to hear. I just don't know if everybody can do that. So that's something just keep in mind. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about in the last little bit is 3D printing. And, um, you know, 3D printing is kind of, we talked about it when we started with digital dentures, that was kind of that first article involved printing something. Um, and so now we went primarily that digital dentures went to milling and now we're kind of have come full circle and are back to, to printing. And, uh, my favorite way to transition from milling to printing is always kind of think of a patient case and you think of, man, have you had a patient that you've treated, you know, that you would love to print or not? And for me, I always think of, well, my favorite denture patient I've ever treated in my life, and it'll probably be this way forever, um, but is where I first went ahead and was tried uh, in 3D printing a denture. And that was with my daughter. She was, I think, four months, three or four months at the time. So I intraorally scanned her mouth. Again, this was all just kind of for fun. Um, then I used a lip ruler just for kicks to see where I want to put the incisal edge position. Um, using her pacifier, I created a, I got a nice centric relation record. Um, 
And then using that scan, so here you can see uh, the, the her uh, intraoral scan of her maxilla and mandible. Then we kind of proposed a denture setup on the computer, and then we printed a denture. Um, and again, I attached the two together. So I, I've got patients that can't wear a denture, so I don't want to try it with a three or four month old. Um, and then you can see her final denture result, which uh, she, you know, again, how often do you get a patient that's that happy? So anyway, she had a good time uh, and actually enjoyed wearing them kind of surprisingly. Um, obviously now she's outgrown them and uh, now it would be an overdenture on natural teeth. But anyway, it was kind of a, a fun project to, to go through. So you got to have some fun with it. It'll be great blackmail for her when she's uh, when she's older. So you got to enjoy it. So with 3D printing, you know, you got to think of how you 3D print something to give you an idea of maybe the good and the bad with with that. So when you think of how a printer works, you know, you put some resin in, uh, it will polymerize that resin and slowly build this three dimensional object. So you can see a denture, you know, base that you can see how that would look like. It has these supports on it. Um, it has some nice benefits you can print. In this picture, you, they printed six mandibular arches, which, you know, you can't mill six at a time on one machine. So that gives you a pretty good idea. But the way it goes is, again, you 3D print this object. You have to then soak this object in isopropyl alcohol to clean off all the remnants of this printing material. Then you have the base and the teeth um, that you have to print separately because you cannot print something that's pink and white at the same time. So you print those separately, then you clean them. Then using some of the print, uh, the, the denture base resin, you'll place that in the recesses in the denture. And then you can go ahead and place the denture teeth um, into the denture and then you put it in a light box to uh, polymerize the whole thing. Um, and that gives you one added strength, plus it allows the uh, teeth to be bonded into the denture base. So you can kind of get an idea of how that process works if you haven't done it before. There's variations to this, of course, and different companies will have suggestions, but this is kind of the overall idea. So thinking of how that's made, it starts to bring up a few questions that you would have that you would want to have answered. So what we're going to do is go through some of these and talk about um, you know, the good and the bad or how they compare to milled and conventional dentures. So let's start with uh, denture base adaptation. And here's, here's a great study that was done where they looked at both maxillary and mandibular dentures that were printed and they went ahead, we're just gonna look at the mandible right now, but they looked at the trueness of a mandibular printed denture. And so here you can see they did a similar thing where they scanned it and saw how much distortion occurs during printing. So this, what they did is they have the file of what the design of the denture looks like. And then after they printed it, they scanned it and they compared the two to see what happened during that process. And so you can see the difference and they found that milled showed better adaptation. Um, again, hard to know if that difference is clinically significant or not. Cause again, in dentures we're very, it's a lot more forgiving because um, it's resting on soft tissue. So that's one question. So you know, milled was better in that regard. But the other question I had was, well, does it make a difference if you print it laying flat, 45 degrees or standing up? And how, how does that apply overall? So here we took um, a, one printing denture material, printed at zero, 45 and 90 degrees. And then also a Dentka resin on a carbon printer. We did the same thing. And we see that depending on the angle you print, you see some differences, no question. Um, and then if you go ahead and you compare that to milled, you know, again, it's pretty easy to see that you have less distortion with milled. And again, that's because if you think of how we go through this process of printing it, the orientation plays a role. Um, how you post-process it when you put it in this light box that exposes it to a specific wavelength of light and heat. Of course, anything we know that we polymerize distorts. So it gives us some ideas. We don't know if it's clinically significant, um, so that's always something good that tells us, you know, this may be perfectly fine, but we know that we're always looking for what's a way we can process something to be the most efficient or most accurate to our records. So if we look at base adaptation, I'd have to say milling is, is superior to printing. However, we don't know the clinical significance of that. If we look at the material strength and we compare milling and printing, here I went and compared the flexural strength of a conventional pack and press denture versus the milled and the printed. And you can see again, milled was stronger <clears throat> than um, the printed or conventional. But what's interesting to point out is conventional and 3D printed, 
very similar and actually printed was a little bit higher. So that tells you, you know, we've been using conventional for a long time. So strength wise, you know, that's good to know, at least it's not significantly worse than conventional. Um, if we look at things like uh, fracture, work of fracture, you can see that conventional actually was stronger than milled uh, and then milled was stronger than printed. And that has to do with, remember, conventional dentures are not as densely packed together when you do the processing of the denture base. So that allows them to flex a little bit more before they fracture, whereas the milled, again, it is very dense and it's stronger, but that also makes it a little more brittle. So that's something to, to keep in mind. However, still uh, printing performed uh, worse than the other two. Another question I had, which was more just for interest sake, was does it matter which 3D printer you use? So here I compared three different printers uh, using the same exact materials. And then we went ahead and we tested to see if it made a difference. And what I found out was um, you can see very similar results no matter which of those printers you use, which is nice because some of these printers are $5,000, some of them are up to $30,000. So it gives you an idea that there's not a huge difference. So it's good to know in that same, that was the same with both flexural and fracture strength. So it's good, good to know that it wasn't a significant difference. So it doesn't seem to be affected by which printer you use. Again, I only use those two materials and I only use those three printers. So you have to know that that's not gonna cover everything. So the, the next one I wanted to talk about, so again, milling was technically stronger than printing. However, um, there's a couple examples where conventional was a, a little stronger. So the last one I'm gonna talk about before I'm done is the bond strength because that was another question I had. So I went through and I tested both the teeth individually bonded into the pink resin. And then also if you went through the a type of process where you had the teeth fused together and you bonded it, I wanted to test and see what that uh, effect was. So here you can see we just had a little contraption with an Instron machine to see how much force it took to debond that tooth. Um, and what we found out was when we had the individual teeth, so here is a carded denture tooth bonded to a milled base, so it was regular PMMA, and I used denture repair resin to bond the two together. And then if we compare that to a printed denture tooth and a printed base that's bonded together with the printed base resin, you can see the difference in, in the force. So it took 65 pounds to debond the, um, the conventional denture tooth uh, using denture repair resin to the milled base and at 42 pounds with the printed. If we went ahead and <clears throat> looked at how they fractured, what's interesting to see is it was not an adhesive failure. It was actually a material failure because it actually fractured through the tooth material. And that was across the board. So that's important to, to recognize because the bonding does not seem to be the issue. The issue seems to be the strength of the tooth material itself, which was quite a surprise to me. Um, if we do the monolithic milled, so this is a milled base where the white and the pink are all milled out of one puck of resin. And then this, the other uh, is the milled base that's, or, sorry, printed that's bonded in. And so you can see it took 160 pounds to fracture the maxillary, uh, the monolithic milled, and 105 for the printed that's bonded and fused together. So that's important to kind of keep in mind. And how did they break? Um, similarly, through the tooth material itself. So it wasn't even technically debonding. It was just fraction of that tooth material. So it brings up two points that I think are important. One, um, if you're going to do a denture like this, you definitely get better strength if you have the teeth fused together. So I think that's one benefit to keep in mind. Um, and still monolithic uh, milling is superior overall.